In a democracy, the will of the people as expressed at the ballot box is sovereign. And he said, Bertie, we've worked something out. He says, you're the only one in this room, as far as we know, that hasn't murdered somebody. I enjoyed almost every minute of it. And obviously, I would have liked to have done it for a little while longer. The first thing John Major said, you have to tell me about Ireland. I don't know anything about Ireland. I may be the Prime Minister, but I don't know anything about it. Within an hour, I found myself in a lot more trouble than I expected to be in. We are living a way beyond our means. The Irish government can no longer stand by and see innocent people injured. When is the general election likely to be? Well, it's not due till February next year, and it'll be sometime between now and then. It's in the interest of the country that responsibility should now pass to a, a younger man. The Irish nation was in a disgraceful condition under the external relation. We do not wish to seek quarrels with any country. The apparatus through which I am now speaking affords one very stimulating thought that gives no opportunity for the opposition to interrupt. of World War II in 1939, many nations joined the Allied cause to stop the advances of the Axis powers. Ireland, however, adopted a policy of neutrality. World War II, I think, is the defining crisis of the 20th century. And de Valera comes to define, to personify, the spirit of what Irish independence is all about. He believed then that the moral order that he sought in world affairs and in international affairs where rights would be protected and small countries would be protected was gone out the window and that the big countries were acting in a purely selfish interest. And he determines in the mid-30s that if there is a war, that it is no place for the small countries because their rights will not count. And he decides on a policy of neutrality uh, and non-intervention. Dublin, and there are more people in the streets than the city has ever seen before. It's National Defence Day, and Prime Minister de Valera is accompanied by his political opponents, Mr Cosgrave and Mr Norton. This is the symbol of ERA's unity as she faces the danger of aggression. Britain and ERA may not always have seen eye to eye in the past, but today, all that is forgotten in the common danger. Mr. de Valera calls on the manhood of error to join in her defense. If Hitler tries to strike that way, he'll find error ready. De Valera is Ireland internationally, and de Valera is Ireland internationally during the Second World War. It's the way he's portrayed in cartoons, along with the other neutrals who won't get involved. And he's seen as personally directing the, the war effort in Ireland, if you like. Well, I think that's a good phrase, Michael, because there was a war effort in Ireland. Mm. And, and when we say neutral, it's not a classic understanding of the word no. neutral. It's not, in, it's not in the Constitution, it wasn't in general practice. It's neutrality on the side of the Allies getting involved in aspects of the war effort, particularly in intelligence sharing and uh, uh, in terms of returning downed pilots and so on. But it's kept publicly in place. Uh, neutrality is publicly in place by speeches or speeches from de Valera. Um, Which is prudent. Yeah. You don't want to go the Germans into sending, mm. you know, Kurt students and, uh, you know, 
the yeah. German paratroopers here. Mm. And de Valera is terrified that there is going to be uh, an invasion of Ireland or that there's going to be some kind of type of aerial bombardment of Ireland. De Valera understood two things very well. He understood that neutrality meant the expression of Irish independence. But he also understood that you had to preserve Irish independence. And he understood very clearly, although he didn't say this publicly, that there was no chance of preserving Irish independence if Germany won the war. So secretly, he set about doing whatever he could to help the British and the Americans to make sure Germany did not win the war. I think at the very beginning of the war, somebody asked who were we neutral for, and the clear answer is they were neutral for the Allies. And particularly, for example, when America entered the war, uh, they used to allow the American soldiers escape over the border. There were cases of American planes landing in Ireland and, you know, the police being called out and the army being called out and being told to get the plane up as fast as you can. There were meetings uh, between the military authorities here and the British military and intelligence and so on. And therefore there was huge uh, cooperation. And then, at the same time, the politics go on. In 1943, there's an election. In 1944, there's an election. Yeah. So de Valera wins both of those elections, very often on the back of scares about invasion. Yeah. And de Valera relished, I think, the idea of Churchill attacking him. It did his TAM ratings or political yeah. ratings oh, no it? harm at yeah. all. At Dunleary, Mr de Valera and ministers watched the finishing touches to a mine, one of the many to be laid in Irish harbours. The mines are part of a big defence plan that will give a good account of itself if and when. Having seen a mine completed for laying, Mr de Valera is anxious to see how it works. So he presses a lever. And that's how. A very noisy greeting for any unwelcome visitor. De Valera's main concern throughout the war, I'm convinced, this can be debated, but I'm convinced, was to ensure uh, no internal conflict in Ireland between pro-German and pro-British forces. That's why he stamps on the IRA, who are pro-German, I mean politically, illiterately in my view, but who are pro-German, and why he also um, adheres to neutrality, even when, one might say opportunistically, had he chosen to do what some Latin American countries did, etc., into the war in '44, when it was clear how it was going to go, he would have enjoyed greater credit at the end. Uh, even at that stage, I think he was afraid there would be such opposition uh, from some IRA quarters and some public opinion uh, that it would have been a divisive factor internally. If an organisation like the IRA is in touch with one of the belligerent powers, is in touch with Germany as they are, this could provide an excuse for the British to intervene, which the British seriously consider doing during 1940. It could provide an excuse for another power to become involved in Ireland. And it could, of course, lead to people refusing to take neutrality seriously. Is it simply the case that they want uh, Germany to win the coming conflict with Britain and then somehow allow a united Irish Republic to come about. That does seem to be the thinking in some of the IRA leadership. But the contacts are serious. Sean Russell goes to Germany. He's feted as a revolutionary leader by the Germans in the summer of 1940. And I think undoubtedly, and for Republicans, it's, you know, it's something that they should ponder. The fact was, had the Germans invaded Ireland during 1940, the IRA leadership certainly would have aided them. During World War II, there were hunger strikes and members of the IRA who killed police and members of the Carly Shikona are executed. And he takes a very, very severe line to the IRA during the hunger strikes during World War II. And from that point on, he introduced the Treason Act and treason against the state in his judgment, once Ireland has adopted its own constitution, is just unforgivable. De Valera also executes six members of the IRA during the war years. In, in 1944, he imports a British hangman 
in order to carry out the execution of Charlie Kearns, the IRA's chief of staff. He allows three IRA prisoners to die on hunger strike during the war years as well, one of them a 1916 veteran, Patrick McGrath. So this, in many ways, is a brutal footnote to the Civil War. He doesn't carry out the same number of executions as the Free State Government did. It's a very different circumstances. But for the IRA, now De Valera has done what the Free Staters did. He has taken the same measures to defeat their organisation. There are proposals, concrete proposals, put to De Valera by the British, in which they said that if he would agree to join the alliance, if he would agree to join the war against Hitler, that they would set about trying to bring about a united Ireland after the end of the war. The, the offer of unity in the summer of 1940, brought across by uh, Malcolm MacDonald uh, to de Valera, is one that de Valera turns down out of hand. There's no chance that there's going to be any uh, Irish unity Ultimate, ultimate Irish unity for immediate involvement in the, in the conflict, joining with Northern Ireland, uh, is not of any interest to de Valera. So I think what the, the unity offer shows is how far de Valera has moved on partition, that partition really is not important to him. What's important to him is sovereignty and foreign policy and showing sovereignty in practice. As far as de Valera was concerned, there was too high a price to pay for United Ireland. And he makes that very clear in a speech in the Senate at the end of the 30s, in which he says, if the price for United Ireland is we are not free to pursue our own independent relations and our own independent foreign policy, if we are not free to have our own uh, traditions, um, then that is too high a price to pay. In 1940, de Valera had achieved something quite remarkable. He had achieved the political unity of 1919. In other words, all the political parties in the Dáil, with the exception of James Dillon and Frank McDermott, were in support of, the, uh, of, of de Valera's position, de Valera's stance. So you had this national policy, and you had, in a sense, the recreation of the Sinn Féin sort yeah. of unity. The joint recruiting of effort that they have. Now, in, exactly, yeah. and uh, the, de Valera isn't p prepared to share too much mm. with, the, uh, with Cosgrave. Uh, trust doesn't go that uh, far after the Civil War. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, there is this, in a sense, breakthrough. The other point was, in 1940, there were many who believed that Germany was going to win the war. And therefore, what was the point in negotiating with the British about a united Ireland if they were going to lose the war anyway? In 1945, as World War II drew to a close, Eamon de Valera offered his condolences on the death of Adolf Hitler to the German ambassador, an act which further strained relations between de Valera and Winston Churchill. When the war ended, Churchill's basic uh, dislike of de Valera bubbled up and in his victory address to the British nation, he made reference to, to how easy it would have been to invade Ireland but he, he didn't do it, and instead he left Mr. de Valera to frolic with his German and Japanese friends. He did pick out some Irish VC winners, but he basically took a strong swipe at de Valera personally. And de Valera seized on the opportunity to, within, I think, three days, reply in what was undoubtedly the high point of his public standing. It became known that uh, he was going to reply over Radio Air and uh, the country just fell silent waiting for this address. It was a hush all throughout the land. And it is an extraordinary speech. Why? Because his real objective is to dampen down nationalist enthusiasm, Irish nationalist enthusiasm, particularly in terms of partition. To dampen it down. But he has to reply to Churchill as a national champion. So how do you do that? Well, he starts off about the weather, <laughs> right? Classic. Everybody in the country at five o'clock, you know, is sitting around trying to hear what's going on and says, thanks be to God for the good weather and the harvest, etc. And then he moves on. You know, certain people have wanted to hear my response. Then he goes, if I can remember now, 
three or four crucial sentences, which are among the most brilliant debating sentences in the entirety of Irish history. He says, I know the answer that springs to the lips of every man of Irish blood. Who heard or read that speech, no matter in what circumstances or in what part of the world he found himself. I know the reply I would have given a quarter of a century ago. And the mind can flash back 1920s, President of Sinn Féin, President of the Undivided Republic, etc., etc. But I have I deliberately... deliberately decided that this is not the reply I shall make tonight. I shall strive not to be guilty of adding any fuel to the flames of hatred and passion, which if continued to be fed, promise to burn up whatever is left by the war of decent human feeling in Europe. And he made this very considered statement, uh, saying that uh, Churchill had spoken in the heat of victory, but no such excuse would be had for him at this more relaxed moment. And he talked about Devil, uh, Churchill thinking it would have been right and proper if he wished to come in and take over Ireland, and therefore add another horrid chapter to the already too long list of terrible deeds and that if you if your might was right was allowed to be enshrined like that in human affairs where was the victory in the war where was the triumph over barbarism surely mr churchill must see that if his contention be admitted in our regard a like justification can be framed for similar acts of aggression elsewhere and no small nation adjoining a great power could ever hope to be permitted to go its own way in peace then he very powerfully, on a moral basis, outlines why he believes that Churchill's stand is wrong. Mr. Churchill is proud of Britain's stand alone after France had fallen and before America entered the war. Could he not find it in his heart, the generosity to acknowledge that there is a small nation that stood alone, not for one year or two, but for several hundred years against aggression. Now, I think it is classic, a classic debating speech. He had very little time in which to compose it. He was helped, of course, by Morris Moynihan. It had been helped probably by Freddie Boland or Joe Walsh from Foreign Affairs, but it's quintessential devil era. And he deserves the plaudits he received for it. When uh, it was over, you could literally hear cheering throughout Ireland. People came out, of the, out onto the street, out of pubs and so forth. And it, it really, again, solidified the country behind him. Baffy, who is the British uh, envoy in Ireland, writes uh, to uh, the Dominion's office saying, you know, uh, de Valera has achieved the popularity of somebody, of, of, of an Irish uh, wing forward who has just scored the, the winning try against England in the Triple and Crown you've game. Done it for him. And you've, you've done the and, opportunity. Well, he yeah. doesn't, you know, yeah. he leaves that to be yeah, read by, by the Dominions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dominions office. They, yeah. they, they know that they have handed sort of uh, popularity, domestic popularity yeah. to de Valera. Yeah. Lord Rugby wrote that, um, you know, Churchill had behaved like a bull in a china shop. And they had had De Valera on toast, and now look at him, he's a hero. You know, they, they'd lost the, the PR battle. So it was a great triumph, and it was a great moment for him. And probably contributed to be staying in power for another couple of years. Following the 1948 general election, no party held an overall majority. It was a very sour mood in Irish politics, 1947-48. Wartime shortages, strikes, high unemployment, emigration, no, no great sense of anything happening, a government that was too long in power, which had become arrogant and remote. The 1948 election, Fine Gael, its vote went down to below 20%. It was 19.5%. They were on the verge of extinction. Had Fianna Fáil had another couple of years in Paris, difficult to see how Fine Gael would have been able to uh, get back. So they are really on their uppers. They need to get back into government to uh, have any kind of political credibility with the electorate. 
There's other groups. There's the Labour Party. Uh, there's a, an offshoot of Labour called National Labour who had split from the main Labour Party because they were allegedly dominated by communists. There was Clown the Taloon, which was a, a party of small farmers from the west of Ireland. And then there was Clown the Publica, which is led by Sean McBride, a radical Republican party, very similar in many ways to Fianna Fáil in, in the early 1930s. And they had great hopes of... Uh, they actually thought they were going to win an overall majority or close to it. They ended up with 10 seats, which just goes to show how... Uh, astute uh, a politician Sean McBride was. There was a, quite a number of independents, the most prominent of whom was James Dillon. So the opposition was hugely, hugely fragmented, but the public mood was one that wanted change. Uh, Fianna Fáil believed it was irreplaceable. And so the election of 1948 came and the opposition parties had a majority. The only way for Fianna Fáil to be removed from office was if every single one of those five parties, plus independents, six independents uh, came together as well, if they all banded together, they could get de Valera out. Now looking at it, you have Fine Gael, which is supposedly pro-Commonwealth, right-wing, private enterprise. You've Clown the Publita, which is Republican and state interventionist. You've Labour, which is the same. You've National Labour, which hates the guts of Labour. You've Clown the Taloon, which nobody really knows what they want. And you've the Independents, who are as odd a bunch as you're likely to find uh, in the doll at any stage. So the idea that they could actually agree on anything seemed outlandish. So to everyone's surprise, uh, Richard Mulcahy, the leader of Fine Gael, uh, began to talk to the other groups. And they found that they could, that they wanted to get Fianna Fáil out, and that was the most enduring, the, the, the deepest principle. But they felt a change of government was good for the country. Uh, they came together. They agreed they could form a government. I think, but the question of leadership was going to be a key question. The problem with Mulcahy was that he had, of course, been chief of staff during the Civil War, and re to Republicans he was anathema. He was known as Dirty Dick and blamed for the execution of Republican prisoners. So it was pretty clear that he wasn't going to be acceptable. To clown the public, to, also to Labour, which was pretty Republican at this stage. So they have a meeting. Uh, Bill Norton, the Labour leader, says um, that they would be prepared to go into government, but not with any... Uh, not under the leadership of somebody who was a party leader. So that rules Mulcahy out. That's a polite way of saying we won't have Dirty Dick. Um, so then they have to think, well, who else would be acceptable? And the name that emerges, it's very interesting, the name that emerges uh, both from la the Labour side, from Clown the Public, to, and from within Fine Gael, if we can't have Mulcahy, who else can we have? And the name that comes up is Jack Costello. He was viewed as you know, a good performer, a safe pair of hands, and a conciliatory figure. There was only one problem. The one person who didn't want to see Jack Costello as Taoiseach was Jack Costello. He resisted it as best he could and said he didn't wish to be Taoiseach and why, why wouldn't General Cahy be Taoiseach or somebody else? And he named certain members of Fine Gael. But he was told that Clonna Pabata wouldn't have anybody else but him. He was then told the same by Labour and that Labour wouldn't have anybody else but him. And... Um, what is necessary to realise is that in this situation he, he had to decide whether, if this was so, whether he could avoid uh, taking on this position which uh, he had completely unexpectedly been offered. So my father reluctantly took on the position. Johnny Cutler was a very able man, obviously, uh, and a very accomplished um, barrister. Uh, but I think certainly his, his role was, and he would have seen his role, and probably had to see his role, as being chairman rather than chief, in Brian Farrell's terminology. Uh, and therefore his job was to keep the potentially conflicting elements within a cabinet that, that went from, by Irish standards, right wing to left wing, the two extremes on the ideological wing, uh, until they could be got into bed together, uh, with John A. Costello tucking in the, <laughs> the sheets. <laughs> um, and so while he was Fine Gael, he had to be a Taoiseach who, in a sense, superseded party loyalties in many ways. And there, there was probably nobody else who could have done that job remotely as well as himself. Because it, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a fresh cabinet. There were a lot of prima donnas in it. And uh, so he had to be a, a particular personality type. Um, he had to show resilience, he had to show patience, he had to show fairness. 
these are not qualities to be despised, even in a Taoiseach. In 1948, an inter-party government was formed with John A. Costello as Taoiseach. The formation of the first inter-party government is important for a number of reasons, and primarily it breaks the 16 years of solid Fianna Fáil office from 1932, but it also brings um, the first proper coalition into Irish uh, politics. And obviously John A. Costello as Taoiseach had to deal with a very different kind of government than any of his predecessors had in the sense that he was presiding over a government of uh, at least five different groups and each one of those had uh, the, the leader of each party was in charge of their ministers. So he was, Costello in effect was the minister presiding over other people presiding over their ministers which didn't really lead to any kind of uh, um, smooth running in, in, in the cabinet. There was never a single dispute of any kind between the Labour Party, the Town of Public the Party, or the Independents during that period of inter-party government. Mr De Valera used to talk about pulling and shoving and all the rest of it for jobs. No such thing arose. There were splits all over the place. Uh, and uh, he, he had to massage the egos, let's put it like that, of many more potential splitters and breaker-uppers than I think more recent coalitions Taoiseach have had to do. It must have required enormous self-control to sustain, even indulge, the, um, the personality projections of a number of the people involved. The prima donnas were a problem, yeah. but they largely came in the form of Clon the Public more mm. than any of the rest of them. So I think for, for a great extent, people were very well behaved and Costello was very well liked by all of his uh, by his ministers and managed to keep them in check in a way that I don't think anyone else could have. They got on very well personally and uh, it, was, it wasn't a question of uh, somebody taking control of, of the government and somebody allowing their ministers to act to, with a loose rein. They cooperated as in government together, I think well. Four hundred and eight years after Henry VIII was crowned the King of Ireland, era cuts its last link with Britain. President Shauna Kelly, the new state's first leader, joins a dense crowd in Dublin's O'Connell Street as the flag of era is hoisted on the GPO building. Here, as the veterans of the 1916 rebellion still recall, was the headquarters of the Sinn Féin Rising. And here, 33 years later to the day, the new era officially becomes an independent republic. Costello didn't approve of the situation, the constitutional status that Ireland was in. De Valera's constitution had in effect made Ireland a republic, he just didn't call it a republic. And he kept this curious uh, link to Britain, the External Relations Act, under which the uh, documents that diplomats presented to foreign governments, they weren't signed by the president, which would be the case in any sovereign state, they were signed by the British king. There was an old music hall play, the new, uh, an old play, Cinderella, when I was young, and uh, the ugly sisters were trying to get into the ball, and they were being fired out by uh, a footman, and they'd jump in to over the threshold and be fired out, and they were singing a song called, now we're in, now we're out, now we're neither in nor out, and that appeared to me to be a perfect illustration of the position that this country was in constitutionally, internationally, under the External Relations Act, and I thought it was the proper thing to get rid of that. There was a meeting of the, of the uh, an informal meeting of the uh, government, and it was decided that they would repeal the External Relations Act. Um, that, in fact, politically, it, the situation was such that it wasn't going to be opposed by de Valera. And uh, that was decided uh, at this meeting of the government. So what happens then is interesting. Costello goes on a visit to Canada. When he's in Canada, he has a couple of run-ins with the Governor-General, Lord Alexander, who is a, a Northern Unionist and uh, not a particularly agreeable 
person by all accounts. Coslow feels he's been snubbed by Alexander at a garden party. And the story has gone around, done the rounds that he was so enraged by this and, and, uh, and so on that he went out and declared that Ireland was leaving the Commonwealth. That's not the case. The insults happened a couple of days before a press conference at which, at which he said this. Uh, and had it not been for the Sunday Independent, that's where the story would have ended. He would have been offended, but he would have gone home. I'm sure he probably would have got over it. The Sunday Independent, uh, in great headlines, announced that the government had intended to repeal the External Relations Act. It was in the papers. Undoubtedly, there was a leak. And um, my father then knew that he was going to be asked this at a press conference, which he'd called sometime anyway to discuss the position of Ireland. And uh, he had to make up his mind whether to deny this or not. But it was true. So he's asked the question, he says, yes, we are going to uh, repeal the External Relations Act. Now, a politician being asked a question by the media, feeling he has to tell the truth, it's an interesting concept. It's not one that's caught on, but it's an interesting concept. But he goes further than that. He's, he's asked a supplementary question. Does that mean Ireland is leaving the Commonwealth? And he also says, yes. One of the ways in which you can get in a very controversial decision through is by not telling your cabinet and just simply making a public announcement. And that's what he did in Canada. So much for and, and, responsibility. And, and, and it, he, he, uh, others would claim that, in a sense, it was discussed in cabinet. There was a decision in principle, and it was just a question of timing. So. Um, in, in thinking uh, around the table here now, I would, I would imagine that uh, this was a very good stratagem to get a very uh, what might have been a very contentious J J James Dillon and others. I mean, you could imagine mm. within the cabinet the sort of type of histrionics that would have taken place if this mm. had gone to a sort of protracted discussion. In practice, it made no difference at all. And in practice, uh, the uh, Irish government and the Irish parliament was absolutely free and independent because of dominion status and now it meant, meant such and such. Uh, so uh, it, in fact, it made very little difference beyond uh, the symbolic importance that was attached to it. Alexis Fitzgerald Costello's uh, son-in-law put it very well. He said, you've put Fine Gael back to where it was when Mick Collins was in charge. And I think that's significant. It regains uh, Fine Gael a place in the centre of Irish political life that it had perhaps lost by um, going off on a Commonwealth tangent. So comes into being the world's youngest republic. Although out of the Commonwealth, Era's many common interests with Britain will still keep the two nations close partners in the years to come. In 1950, Costello's Minister for Health, Noel Brown, introduced a scheme which would prove highly controversial. The mother and child scheme was not as big an issue at the time as it has subsequently become. And part of the problem was that ministers were largely left on their own by Costello to devise their own plans. The mother and child scheme was offering free medical treatment for mothers and for children up to the age of 16. That was the plan. It had been designed by Fianna Fáil and it had run into serious opposition in the Dáil from Fine Gael. So they were completely opposed to it on ideological grounds. Uh, then you come to the first inter-party government. Clan the Public obviously is a left-wing party. They're very keen on this idea. So the compromise is that the mother and child scheme will go ahead and Noel Brown is in charge as Minister for Health of implementing it. Brown didn't communicate very well with his cabinet colleagues. He was involved in a major, hugely personal and very bitter row with Sean McBride at the time so that the town of public, the party, was divided within cabinet. Noel Brown got into a huge row with the medical profession. And the medical profession were looking after their own interests. They're, the Irish Medical Association is a trade union for doctors. They don't want to see their status diminished. They don't want to become um, a salaried uh, arm of the state. They want to have private practice and charge as much as the market will bear, which is reasonable enough from their point of view. Brown was very opposed to that kind of viewpoint. He, he was a sincere believer in socialised medicine and uh, you know, the two were at loggerheads. And it was very difficult to see how they could reach a compromise. No one has any idea what Brown is actually up to until almost the crisis actually yeah, breaks. It's a danger of coalition. Again. So it is a danger of coalition, but I think it could have happened otherwise. When mm. if, well, I mean, unless you want to sort of um, introduce a three-line whip to your cabinet and say, you know, you must come in and tell us exactly what, what you're doing on everything. Do you, you get the impression in the inter-party government that the, the rules of cabinet government are breaking down? The bishops got involved on an issue where they had very little knowledge, 
uh, where they were not particularly entitled to get involved, the ante was upped. The bishops effectively said, this is a moral issue. We speak with authority on moral issues, and as Catholics you have to obey us. Why were the bishops so concerned about it? They said it was because of uh, Catholic social teaching, that the state shouldn't do for people what people could do for themselves. So they argued that there should be a means test. It was only people who actually needed free medicine should get free medicine. That's where the bishops were. They sincerely believed that this was going to turn into socialised medicine and that this would be a very bad thing for Ireland. If we weren't told, as we were told, by an authoritative body in the Catholic Church, that a measure, if brought into action, would be contrary uh, to uh, morality and the teaching of the church, then we were bound, in my opinion, I'd do the same again. And I know the government would have to do it. I don't think his um, religious beliefs had had the slightest effect on, on that situation. I don't think it's correct to, to imagine him going over the head of Noel Brown. A situation developed which any teacher would have to try to deal with. One of his ministers had got into very serious controversy, first of all with the medical profession, and then with the hierarchy. And he, as teacher, he would have to try to deal with it, which he then, which he did deal with. Costello, as Taoiseach, had argued Brown's case with the doctors. As a barrister, he was always good at, at taking a brief and running with it. Even though he disapproved of this scheme, he actually uh, went in and argued with the doctors about it. And he was also in touch with John Charles McQuaid, the Archbishop of Dublin, very close touch, frequent meetings between them. And it quickly becomes clear that Costello had effectively decided he'd had enough of Brown and the rest of the government had decided the same. He was, in a sense, using the hierarchy's objections as a way of getting rid of Brown, of undermining Brown, uh, uh, and, and thereby killing his scheme. Then, uh, to everybody's astonishment, his own party told him that he had to resign. I never exercised my constitutional right to call upon him to resign. He resigned himself, having been directed to do so by his own party. There is one big misconception, and that is that the mother and child scheme brought the government down. It didn't. The government fell a few months later on the question of the price of dairy produce. A number of rural de deputies wanted the price of milk increased by two pence a gallon, I think it was. So this was a decision for James Dillon, the Minister for Agriculture, who had a flair for publicity and a knack for annoying people. And uh, the people he was annoying at this stage were the independent deputies on whose support the government depended. So they were looking for a, a two pence a gallon increase in the price of milk. He wanted to decrease the price of milk paid to farmers. So it was quite clear that the government were going to lose a vote in the Dáil on this issue because Brown and his allies were already in opposition, so Costello threw in the towel and called an election. What happened was Brown and a couple of others who had all been supportive of the first inter-party government voted for de Valera. So that's the end of the first inter-party government experiment at that stage. Following the 1951 general election, Eamon de Valera formed a minority Fianna Fáil government. De Valera certainly didn't distinguish himself in the 50s. I mean, the high watermark of his achievement is 32, 45. There's no question about that. But he provides a kind of steady hand at the helm uh, while we're acclimatising to the post-war world. Ireland at the time had a lot of um, what were called sterling reserves, money that had been accumulated over the years in, in, held in British banks. And once they started to uh, reduce... Uh, everybody in the Department of Finance got very upset uh, and concerned and uh, we were importing more than we were exporting so this heralded economic ruin according to them so Sean McEntee, the Minister for Finance brought in a very um, a very harsh budget in 1952 and the aim of that was to reduce the amount of uh, spending money people had so they'd stop buying imports uh, and that led to really unprecedented unpopularity the government lost a string of by-elections and eventually uh, called an election in 1954 and the inter-party government uh, was formed. Do you think you can overcome Ireland's economic problems, unemployment and so on? I have no doubt whatever that if we get sufficient time to carry out the policies and the plans that we have arranged for. 
that the economic future of this country is very bright and that we will be able to overcome the unemployment problem and bring it back to the condition that we had some years ago where we had the least number of unemployed ever in the history of this state. Costello was back in again, second time as Taoiseach, probably seen as, as having a lot more authority because of that. Um, and without Clowna Publit, without Sean McBride, without uh, Noel Brown in Cabinet, things went a lot easier. But I think the main criticism you could make of that government is that Costello knew that there needed to be changes in economic policy, there needed to be more foreign investment, there needed to be more uh, structured approach to capital investment, and there needed to be more support for exports. He knew all these things, but he wasn't able to achieve any of them uh, until the very end of that government when the economic crisis was at its height. In 1956, when the country was on the brink of economic ruin, he came up with a, a fairly far-reaching and comprehensive economic policy, uh, the, the, the plan for production. And what Costello does in 1956 is he comes up with a plan that looks at let's increase exports, let's increase production, let's try and build our way out of the crisis rather than trying to cut our way out of the crisis. Now, what happened in that government, of course, was uh, two things. One was the world economic situation was deplorable arising from the Suez um, Canal and the enormous cr pre increase in the price of, of oil. This was one problem. The economic, world economic situation became very, very difficult and obviously affected us in Ireland. And then the second problem was the IRA. signs throughout the period of the second inter-party government that uh, things were brewing. There were a number of arms raids on, on British Army barracks um, as the IRA geared up towards moving towards um, a, a resumption of violence. There was also a breakaway Republican group, uh, Sarah Ulla. And the interesting thing about that is that the leader of that group was a man called Liam Kelly, who was a senator. He was elected to the Senate. Uh, with the support of Clan the Public and Sean McBride uh, and he'd broken away from the IRA because he wanted to take immediate action. Uh, so it was interesting that McBride, who's supporting the government, is also supporting this uh, renegade Republican uh, who's prepared to take uh, violent action against, against the British forces. So that, I suppose, should have been a warning sign to Costello that if he were to move against the IRA in any significant way that he would certainly be in danger of losing McBride's support. Once the border campaign breaks out and he makes a major speech in which he signals his intention of taking stern action against the IRA and McBride pulls the plug. McBride would end then a vote of no confidence and then that meant that the government uh, dissolved and they were beaten in the election. In 1957, Fianna Fáil were returned to power with an overall majority and Eamon de Valera became Taoiseach for the last time. No Taoiseach, to my knowledge, if you inspect his uh, buttocks, will have a bayonet on, mark on it. They went forward voluntarily into politics, got elected and fought to keep power. Now, the quintessential getter and keeper of power in 20th century Ireland was Eamon de Valera. Irish politics in the 1950s was so volatile that Fianna Fáil as a party uh, were terrified at the thought that they would have to go into any election in that period without de Valera as leader because he was such a talisman, such a totem for them. But plainly, um, uh, after the 57 election when they came back into power, uh, de Valera, although he still loved the reins of power, he was virtually blind. And certainly de Valera was well past the sell-by date as an active politician. In 1959, at the age of 76, Eamon de Valera retired as Taoiseach. His last day in office uh, was a huge press occasion, one of the big photo calls that Upper Merion Street has ever seen. And Pori Cohenricon, who was his secretary, was out with the press corps, jollying them along, and no de Valera. 
So finally it was getting embarrassing and he went in and he was very close to De Valera and could take liberties with him. And he found De Valera crouched over at his desk with his arm around a sort of console. It's an old fashioned method of, of communication. It was literally the levers of power. There were brass levers and they connected you with some head of government, the head of the guards, the chief of staff of the army, secretary of the government and so on. And uh, the exact words that Porrick used were, chief, we're all waiting for you outside. They all want to see how beautiful you are. You must come out. And uh, he noticed that de Valera was um, crying. So he said, um, What's up, Chief? You're, you're looking fine, you know? And de Valera said to him, Porrick, it's very hard to leave the levers of power. By 1959, Sean Lamas is clearly the Fianna Fáil person in waiting. He's derived a fair bit of experience. Um, the country. It's an understatement. Well, yeah. you know, he'd been around <laughs> yeah. for a while. Yeah. Uh, some seismic yeah. events had taken place yeah. when Fianna Fáil were out of office. Mm -hmm. And he's able to take power because de Valera is elevated to the highest office of the land, that of presidency. And, and what, an, what an apt and avid Taoiseach he became. De Valera did regard Lamas as the best successor. But Lamas had the huge advantage of being significantly younger than any of his cabinet colleagues. He was 17 years younger than de Valera, but he was also younger than all his senior cabinet colleagues, who are quite clearly at this stage on the way out, even though they didn't think they were themselves. If, if de Valera had retired at the, uh, at the time of the end of the war, at the time he was going on the triumphal procession, and allowed uh, Lamas to take over the party then, I think Ireland would have been far better. All the different, the dismantling of the tariffs, the backward looking, the improvement in education, the concentration and join the EEC, which de Valera didn't favour. All that would have come much earlier. I mean, Sean Lamas was the greatest teacher of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. 